Darcy, appreciate this opportunity. Well, uh, as we get started, I want to lay out a few, uh, um, uh, put out some information for everyone who is uh, coming online. First off, uh, as was mentioned, we are, we, get, we are getting a little bit of a late start. We apologize for that. Uh, as uh, we all know, living in this uh, time of Zoom, there, there are adjustments that often have to be made. Um, but uh, you know, we've made that, we've made it happen, and uh, we welcome you all here today. Uh, everyone is muted. Uh, the questions that we are going to be asking today have been pre-submitted. Uh, some of these questions are, uh, many people have submitted the same questions. So we've picked one question that represents all of those questions if there are multiple. So uh, um, uh, many of them are individual questions and those will be asked as they have been asked to us. One of the things that we'll, we have, are pointing out that we are not gonna be mentioning names of who asked what question, we're just gonna ask the question. Um, also um, to note, uh, um, while we do have um, two of our representatives here, um, Senator Bray is on his way and will be coming in and joining us a little later. And uh, Representative Bo Baird is going to have to leave at 10. So he will have to leave a little early. So it'll balance out for us all. Um, so as we go through this, one um, first thing we want to do is uh, just ask everyone to be respectful. Uh, please make sure that you do keep yourself unmuted. Um, you, you know, if you have a question, uh, you can submit that um, via Facebook or chat to uh, to um, the chamber. If we have time after we've gone through the questions that have been submitted, then we will try to address some of those questions. Uh, if not, as has been said those questions will be given to our, um, our legislators today so they will have a chance to review them. With that, I think we're gonna go ahead and start with the introductions. So uh, we'll go ahead and start uh, first with Peggy uh, Mayfield, uh, state representative, and then we'll go after that. If, uh, if Peggy, if you would introduce yourself and speak for a few minutes about uh, some of the things you'd like to do, uh, speak about in your introduction, and then we'll do the same thing for Representative Bill Baird. Okay, and just for clarity's sake, Daniel, do, do you want us to hit the highlights of legislation now, or will that be um, after introductions? Not all. Um, I would hit the highlights now um, because not necessarily all the things that are, you're, you're, we are highlighting will necessarily be addressed in this. So I think it's good to give an overview. And then if, if it does, if a question does touch on that, then you'll have an opportunity to give a little bit more detail on that. Okay, all right, thanks. I, I didn't want to steal anyone else's thunder. Um, as we go through the different legislators, I want to leave something for everybody to talk about. So <clears throat> I'm Peggy Mayfield, I represent District 60, which is pretty much a vertical district that runs from Mooresville um, all the way down to Bloomington, using more or less 37 and 67 as the guardrails. Um, so we ha I have a very diverse district. Parts of Bloomington, the eastern side of Monroe County is a little more rural. And then, of course, Morgan County you know, is, is considered rural, um, although you know, I have the city of Martinsville, 10,000 people. This year in the General Assembly has been totally different. Uh, it's, it's, it's been an adjustment for everybody. I have not bumped into Senator Bray yet this session because we are in two separate buildings. Uh, that just gives you a feel for it. I only get to see my LA, or my, my legislative assistant, you know, usually we're meeting multiple times a day. Um, I almost have to put it on the calendar weekly to sit down with him and catch up because the way that we are, I won't say isolated, but the way we are separated, it just doesn't lend itself to a lot of interpersonal contact. Communication has been a real challenge. So it takes a lot more effort just to get together with other legislators to talk about bills. Um, you know, talking to those chairmen and we want to get your bill heard. It's very challenging to track them down. In the year that we really were trying to focus on minimal legislation because of COVID, we were only going to try and focus on what absolutely has to be done. Boy, we still managed to file over a thousand bills this year. 600 in the House, 400 in the Senate. Now halfway through, we just changed chambers. So halfway through, out of those 600, 149 of them passed the House. So we really whittled them down uh, even more than, than typical years. Out of the Senate, they had 404 bills. They passed 167. So in the second half, those will be whittled down even further. This might be the lowest number of bills passed as a percentage 
of any year since I've been in the legislature, because these will these will pare down where you have 300 bills will probably be cut by another third uh, by the time this is done. Um, I had a bill that I think is very important to not, not just the state, but very important to Martinsville and Morgan County. It was trying to create an IDEM database for contaminated properties so that it was more usable. Uh, everybody might, it's probably familiar with our Superfund site, so I won't go into a lot of the background there. And the studies are continuing on that, uh, which I think is great information. I was trying to get a lot of the information that the state already has in their public databases into a more user-friendly database. So you could, in theory, look up a property to find out, is this a contaminated property or not? You can now if you know how to do it, but it's very cumbersome. So I'm gonna continue working with IDEM on that. It ended up that since the fiscal was um, over 50,000 that it would have had to have been recommitted. I only got even a partial commitment from the environmental committee chairman to hear it, but then it would be recommitted to Ways and Means and we would have run out of time before that was heard. So uh, since it would be a budget year that I have to do this, I am, going, I am committed to continuing to develop this concept over the next two years. And if IDEM doesn't have the capability on its own, they do have some mapping capabilities right now, but if they don't have the ability to turn this into something that I guess I had envisioned, um, then I will be reintroducing that bill in 2023 for the budget session. And, and in between working with a lot of parties to try and make sure that it will move forward um, at that time. So that was one of my priority bills and the leadership was aware of it. It just hit some snags, which is not uncommon in the first few years that you introduce a bill to not have it passed. I've had bills that passed unanimously that took five years to get a hearing, had one yesterday, introduced it for three years and uh, it sailed through. Uh, it, so far it's been unanimous. It's going to the Senate floor next week. I'm assuming it will be unanimous there too. It regards fire territories. So, um, as a legislator, I've had to learn a lot of patience. On the, on the larger scale, uh, you know, a year ago at this time, we were un under the beginning of the COVID emergency order and anticipating being in dire financial straits at the end of that year. The, the state, the governor asked for 15% reversions from all of our agencies. He asked for 7% reversions from our higher ed institutions. He did not touch K-12 education. He left that in, uh, intact. So as, as we've moved on, we have found ourselves in a position because of past decisions about being fiscally responsible. We not only are coming out of this pandemic um, financially unscathed as a state, we are able to make some, we have the funds available to make some very strategic investments and not just worried about how the state is going to pay its bills. We have re uh, reinvested that 15%. The money's not going back to where exactly where it came from because what we figured out is some areas where we cut 15%, they didn't need it to begin with, but other areas we cut 15% and they needed it all back. So, um, the money's going back out where we think it's best used. Um, we're making you know, substantial investments in broadband. $250 million will be going to broadband. Um, you know, education is almost, well, it's 380 some million dollars to education. And depending on how that student count comes out, it could be even more. Um, we have several agenda bills. I know that I want to give other opportunities, but for the other legislators, but we have grants for small businesses that were affected by COVID. It's targeted to the entertain, entertainment hospitality industry, but it's uh, available to other industries that the IEDC deems uh, suffered significantly more than other industries. So there's a grant program for those small businesses and it has the kind of guardrails that will prevent 
what people saw with the PPP, the large corporations gobbling up all the money. This is really targeted toward the small guy, less than 100 employees. So I will stop there and let the others um, have a say, and then we can go back and, and touch on other bills of interest uh, after they're done. Great, Bo, if you'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself and uh, give a little bit of an update as well. Absolutely, thank you, Daniel. And uh, thank you everybody for being here this morning. This truly, in my opinion, is one of the most critical parts of the process. This is an opportunity for myself and the fellow uh, legislators to get out of the state house, come back to the district, while we still have an opportunity to make changes to legislation and, and really talk out things that are going on, make you aware of uh, legislation that's coming down the pipeline. But also I've learned sometimes you, you all know better than us uh, stuff that's important to you. So in that vein, I'm gonna keep my remarks brief this morning because Daniel, one thing I've learned is things that I consider to be my highlight is not necessarily that important to everybody else. And I wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to get to everybody's questions. Uh, but first I am Bo Baird, I represent House District 44. I do not represent Martinsville, but I do represent a portion of Morgan County. My district um, start, the very Eastern edge is between uh, Mooresville and Monrovia, and then goes down and uh, down to about Gosport along 39. So I have that Northwestern corner. Uh, one thing I do wanna make sure I point out, you guys are very well rep represented and I can't say that enough with Representative Mayfield and Senator Bray. Uh, I lean on both of those as senior advisors and uh, Representative Mayfield, I get to watch her in caucus really stand up for your community and really fight for the things that um, are important to the community. And I, I try to follow her lead and just learn by, um, learn by watching her. Um, I'm not gonna repeat everything that she said. There were a few things that I wanna point out. Um, one thing I was really happy to see, you don't see government move very fast, very often. But I was really happy to see us uh, pass out of the House, and I think it's passed out of the Senate already, was um, uh, uh, I think it was House Bill 1005, which fully funded our public schools. And the important part was Indiana Code currently has if more than 50% of your virtual, more than 50% of your education is received virtually, you don't receive full funding. And we didn't want public schools to be hurt by this pandemic. So we passed that where um, they do receive the full amount of funding that was allotted to them. Um, real quickly, I wanna tell you about one bill, one bill that I have, let me, sorry, let me put my phone on, do not disturb. Um, one bill that I have that made it out of the house and moving over to the Senate and it has a hearing next week was a bill that I have drafted for EMS. And specifically what it's looking to do is earn a more reasonable reimbursement rate for EMS, while also trying to eliminate balanced billing for our constituents. Now, I will tell you, this has been a learning example for me because uh, this is the first time I've had a bill that what I drafted is not what's coming out of the house uh, at all. Uh, so, and I see Representative Mayfield laughing. She, she understands this process, but um, you know, I, I just wanted to come in and immediately say there was no balanced billing allowed for our constituents. And this is a very narrowly focused bill that looks at inner facility transfers ordered by a doctor. So if, if you go to a hospital in rural Indiana, which most of my district is very rural, and you need to receive a transport by ambulance, um, and it's ordered by a doctor from that hospital to a hospital in Indianapolis, my feeling is my constituent has no choice in who provides that service. They have no knowledge of how much that service is going to cost. And they have no idea who's responsible for that service. And in my opinion, I can think of no other industry where we make the person receiving that service 100% responsible for that charge when they have no knowledge and no say. And, and I just don't think that's right. Um, so I drafted legislation that my original legislation just said, you can't balance bill for this service. Um, it was brought to me by a constituent who had a um, son that needed transported from one hospital to the other. And his, uh, his balance bill is just under $4,000. And um, so anyways, the bill now is, is a good first step towards, towards solving that problem, but it doesn't solve the problem fully. So hopefully next year uh, I can bring it back and finish, finish solving that problem. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Daniel. Great, thank you. Well, um, as, before we start on the questions, I do want to... Uh, just give everyone uh, some information that this video, the full video will be put on the Chamber's YouTube channel 
and on the martinsvillechamber.com website today. So uh, for those people who were not able to attend or not able to view it, they will have the opportunity to, to see rec the uh, recording of this event. With that, <coughs> excuse me, I'm gonna clear my throat because we need to jump into some questions. <coughs> excuse me. So first off, uh, first question, and we'll give this to uh, both our legislators. We'll start with uh, um, Peggy first, and then both you wanna jump on, and then we'll alternate back and forth until uh, Rod uh, gets on he here with us. Uh, our first question is regard, uh, regarding the subject of education. And uh, the question is, do you think competitive teacher salaries would improve uh, in public? Uh, do you think that we could improve? Uh, uh, let me reread re this. Do you think teacher salaries can be more competitive in Indiana public schools? And what could you do to improve that? Um. Well, yeah, they, they can be. And uh, I was just going through last night, I had a lot of data on the raises that were given out of the last cycle. Um, like all but four districts gave their teachers actual raises, not just stipends. So I know we had the teacher pay report and it's being reviewed and it recommended that Indiana invest about 600 million more uh, in teacher pay to bring everything com competitive. And uh, that's and it's being analyzed. Um, the pay is we fund down to the districts, and then the, the districts distribute it. And that's really what it boils down to. One of the things we did in the last budget cycle was pay down the teacher pension, which freed up you know seventy million dollars that schools would not have to pay themselves into the pension fund, and they could use that money toward teacher pay. And many of them did, but not all. So I think it has to be a priority of the local school board to figure out how to get there along with state funding uh, and how you distribute that. I don't think you want the General Assembly determining teacher pay because all of our districts are very different. What it costs to live in Hamilton Heights is very different than what it costs to live in, oh, you know, Henry County. Um, so it, that should be a localized decision. Sorry, I, I want to see if, if Bo wants to chat. Yeah, uh, I was just trying not to talk over you, uh, Representative Mayfield. Um, you know, the first thing I like to start off with every time we talk about education, and uh, Representative Mayfield, you can correct me if my numbers are wrong, uh, as we both serve on Ways and Means, and this is my first year on Ways and Means. Um, but the first thing I like to start off with is we have over seven and a half billion per year that's going into K through 12 funding. And just this year, we dedicated more than 438 million in new funding to K through 12. So there's a lot of money in this system. So I, I think that um, I just wanna echo what Representative Mayfield is saying and that um, you don't want us dictating the salary of every single teacher. You want us providing the funds and allowing your local community to decide where those pay raises should go and, and what teachers should receive them. Um, but I think that is how we make our teacher pay more competitive. Great, thank you. Uh, let's move on to another question. Uh, our, our next question is related to co the COVID-19 pandemic. And the question is this, <clears throat> what is the status of legislation to provide COVID-19 liability protection to businesses, governments, and individuals? So we've already passed out of the House and I believe it's passed out of the Senate, but I'm not sure of that. Um, we have passed that protection already. And I believe the governor signed it a little over a week ago. Okay. Great. Um, I am told that uh, um, Senator Bray is on the phone. Um, he is actually on a phone, so we, won't, we don't have him by... Uh, um, by uh, by video, um, Rod uh, Senator Bray, are you there? You'll need to unmute yourself. Or can can you hear me now? We can. Ah, good, good. Yeah. First of all, let me. I want to address that, but I want to apologize for being late. I uh, uh, just got tangled up and couldn't get back to uh, my office, and that's why I'm calling on the phone now. But uh, 
Uh, so many apologies for, for that to everybody that's involved in the call. So with regard to that question, uh, Representative Mayfield and Representative Baird are exactly correct. That bill is was Senate Bill Number One, and it uh, passed through the Senate, already passed quickly through the House, and it's been uh, to the governor's desk, and he has signed it. And that so that bill has already taken effect. And as the language said in the bill, it uh, it you know, takes effect immediately, and actually actually goes retroactive back to a um, uh, back into the 2020 year, and so uh, it. It's in effect now, and it, impl- it, it infects, or affects private businesses, local governments, schools, charitable organizations as well. So that is up and running. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, the next question is regarding the Second Amendment. It, uh, the question is, is this. What is the status of HB 1369 that removes the firearm license requirement? And what are your thoughts on this bill? And uh, Senator Ray, we'll let you be first on this one. Yeah, so that bill has come over from the House. And uh, I believe Representative Mayfield at least was on it. And uh, we've taken a look at it. It's kind of on the way to uh, Judiciary Committee, which is where those bills normally go. And uh, I, I think it has... Um, it's being received relatively positively. The concern is that generally law enforcement is, is um, opposed to it. And when I say that, I mean the Sheriff's Association is neutral, but the Chiefs of Police, the State Police, along with the State Police Alliance, have decided they have concerns about the bill. And I think the concern comes from um, uh, not people exercising their Second Amendment right at all, but they have concerns that when they're out on the streets, in the middle of the night and they're stopping someone trying to figure out if that person has the right to have a weapon or not. There isn't a database currently that allows that to happen in real time so that they can figure it out from the street. And uh, the House put together some language so that this bill would take effect in 2022 with the idea that they can have that database put together. But there's the database is very complex and very problematic and does not exist today. And so that is a challenge that we're, we will try to grapple with and take a look at as we move that bill through the through the Senate. Representative Baird, do you have any thoughts on uh, House Bill 1369? I think it's been covered pretty thoroughly. Great. Um, and Representative Mayfield, do you want to, is there anything you want to add to it? Yeah. Um, because it's a, it's a little more um, involved than what has been described so far. So there were seven basically constitutional carry bills introduced this session. Uh, Se- Representative Smaltz is the one that moved. <clears throat> it's easy to do when you're the chairman of the committee. Uh, I was on one of those bills, but it was not this one. So when we okay. have a limit of four, we have a limit of four authors to a bill. Um, in the House. I don't think the Senate has limitations on the number of authors. So, but I did run the committee hearing because the committee chair was the one presenting the bill. Uh, you said something, Senator Bray, that it interested me because even though the state police opposed it and the police chiefs opposed it, which I will point out, both of those are appointed positions, whereas prosecutors and sheriffs remain neutral and those are elected positions answerable to the public. But you said the alliance, the state police alliance opposed it. So did they change their position? Because they were they, at one point neutral. They did change their position. And I think it came back when they, when they, uh, uh, when they saw the bill as it came out of the house and uh, kind, of, kind of putting it, putting the start date off so that the database could be, uh, could be put into place that caused them enough concern to change their position on it. Okay, so part of the reason for, and I'll explain a little bit of background, um, part of the reason for the March 22 start date was so that we could be in session if we needed to adjust this bill instead of having it effective on a July 1st when we're in recess. Um, And it wasn't necessarily so that the database could be established the role of the, um, the bill that was amended was that they needed to bring forth a process by which they could use information that the state already has 
and put it at the fingertips of the officers in the vehicles. This information is available to dispatch. They just can't get it out to the cars. And so it's how, how do we get it in the hands of the person who's you know, pulling over or coming on a scene immediately rather than having to go through a relay system to get that information. Um, the basis of, if you were to describe the bill in general, when we say a lawful carry, it basically means if you were to apply for a gun permit and you would have been granted a gun permit, you are considered a proper person, this bill means you don't have to apply anymore. If you were to apply for a gun permit and you would be denied a gun permit, you are a prohibited person and this bill means you still cannot carry a firearm. So it doesn't change the eligibility of who gets to carry a firearm in any way, shape or form. It just means that if you are a lawful person who would normally have to pay for that privilege or right, uh, you no longer have to do that. Everybody else, it's still illegal for you to uh, carry a firearm. The, we have whittled away over the past four years, and I believe Senator Bray was the chair of the Summer Study Committee between Judiciary and Public Policy, where we took lengthy right. testimony on this. And we worked on eliminating all of the opposition, one piece at a time, the, the most, other than not having the information at their fingertips, and we asked, I think every officer who testified, we asked them, what do you need and they all said, we need to know who the bad guys are. And so that's what we're trying to give them an opportunity to say, you have all this information, how do we get it to your fingertips? Um, but the money was the other thing. And we finally got a commitment this year to replace the funding that would be eliminated if no one had to pay for a license anymore. We're gonna uh, commit to three and a half million dollars a year with generally there's about $5 million a year that is paid for license permits. And so there's still this gap and you think, well, where's that gap gonna be filled by? We still anticipate a lot of people getting their handgun license for reciprocal purposes. So you will still need a handgun license in 30 some states acknowledge Indiana's license for reciprocal purposes. So if you cross over into their state, that you are uh, you know, properly licensed. Um, there are 11 states that don't recognize Indiana's license for a combination of, of three different reasons. One, we don't put a photograph on our, uh, on our carry permits. Two, we don't require training. And three, we give permits to 18 year olds when a lot of states don't go do it till they're 21. So any combination of those three reasons would be a reason why a state would not recognize ours. But out of those 11 states, seven of them don't recognize anybody's. So there is no reciprocity established between seven states. So that's just a little bit more um, background on that. We had three officers testify against, five officers, including one who had been shot in the line of duty, testify in favor of, and we had eight more email testimonies all in favor of that we would not have the chance to, to read into the record during the hearing. So um, it was a bipartisan measure. We had Democrat and Republican support on this as it passed the House. And so I'm looking forward to the debate as it goes forth in the Senate. Great, thank you. I think one thing, one other, one other thing I can add there just real quick is uh, Representative Mayfield already said about that the funding and uh, that comes from the uh, uh, from the application license applications. That is an important piece because that's used. It goes back to local uh, departments and they use that for uh, training for their law enforcement officers. So we don't want to shortchange them in that regard. And that's the important piece about uh, what, what Peggy said about finding some dollars for that and we'll make sure we uh, continue to fund their uh, ability to train their officers, which I think is really important. Great, thank you, uh, Senator Bray. All right, moving on to our next question. This one is uh, regarding local budgets. Uh, <clears throat> the question is this, expenses like snow removal and de-icing are not included as eligible expenses for motor vehicle highway distribution, commonly known as MVH. Uh, these are not discretionary, discretionary items for local gov governments. 
What are your thoughts on amending the eligible expenses and adding winterizing expenses to the eligible expenses for MDH? Um, and uh, Representative Baird, we'll let you go first this time. Actually, Daniel, I'm going to defer to uh, one of my senior legislators on this one. This is a little outside of my wheelhouse, so. I can make a couple comments on it, Daniel, if you like. Please, please. Uh, so, first of all, I mean, a little bit of history. Some, some folks will know this and, and, and some won't, but um, a few years ago, we put into place that uh, the local governments had to spend at least 50% of their MVH dollars on, uh, on the roads. And that means putting asphalt on the roads, new paving, patching, uh, things of that nature, and that they couldn't be used for a number of different things, um, specifically, specifically kind of targeted to, you know, administrative costs within the like the, the county highway department, but also things like uh, snow removal, et cetera. And from my, from my perspective, two things going on. First of all, I would be in support of adding uh, to allow that money to be used for uh, salt and snow removal. That's obviously part and parcel with paving the roads and keeping them open when, they, when, they, uh, uh, when the snow covers them and the ice gets on them. So I think that's a smart move. The other thing that we've worked on, and I think the house has too, is... Uh, it's become more challenging lately because revenue has dropped through COVID. And so it's become more challenging for local governments to continue to put at least 50% on the roads and not have to use some or more than that percentage on the, uh, the county highway department, you know, salaries and other expenses that might be going into that. And so uh, we've talked at, uh, at length about changing that number at the very least temporarily to go to uh, 60 40 so that they could lower that amount that goes to the roads at 40 percent and uh, i think that's an idea that has some uh some probability of passing because it'll give the local governments a little bit of relief when the revenue has dropped because there's just fewer people on the roads and less gas tax thank you representative mayfield uh, do you have anything you want to add to that conversation no, I, I think the Senator Bray did. We can always discuss it, but I think that the higher priority is on the um, the more permanent infrastructure aspect of it. Excellent. Thank you. Um, one thing we do want to do um, here before we move on is I know that Representative, Representative Baird has to leave at 10. He has a hard cutoff time. Uh, we have about five minutes before he, he needs to leave. Uh, Representative Baird, is there something in particular before we go on to some other questions that you'd like to bring up or, or close with as we continue through these conversations? I guess I'd, I'd truly just like to reiterate what I said in the beginning. And even though I don't represent Martinsville, uh, I, ca I can't stress how, how, well represented, how well represented you guys are with Senator Bray and Representative Mayfield. And I truly do lean on them a lot. Uh, I'm not a freshman anymore. I am in my second term but I'm still learning the ropes as I explained with the bill that I'm working on currently uh, centered around EMS. But um, with that, I'd like to get back to the questions, Daniel, so we can get one more in before I go. Great, we'll do that. Um, next question is uh, in regards to wetlands. Um, can you explain in uh, layman's terms about the state's plans for wetlands uh, within the state of Indiana? Daniel, that's a Senate bill. I can take its first crack at it if you if you like. Please. So it's Senate Bill 389 uh, filed by uh, uh, Senator uh, Garton down in the uh, Jeffersonville, New Albany area, and uh, you know the bill as it uh, as it stands started by saying that um, it uh, was going to kind of remove the uh, state jurisdiction over um, uh, over new wetlands and the, the thing to keep in mind first of all is most most of our uh, water and wetlands legislation is federal and so this wouldn't be impact this wouldn't impact that in any way shape or form and uh, uh but i think that probably everybody every senator and every representative have had some concerns with the way that idem has implemented the wetlands program not necessarily with the program itself but the way it's been exercised because they have had a experiences and example after example of scenarios like what I can paint for you though so some uh, agricultural lands and farmer had um, 
a couple of wet years, and so there was a spot of about 100 foot by 100 foot that couldn't get plowed in the farmer's field. And then um, um, year three, they go back in, it's a little drier, and so they start to plow that spot, and they get contacted by IDEM and says, hey, that's a wetland, you can't farm that. The farmer's response is, well, it's been farmed for 120 years, this exact spot, and it, it never has been a wetland. And then all of a sudden they're put in a position where they've had to um, uh, pay a fee in lieu of that wetland. So they pay to allow a wetland four times the wetland somewhere else so they can farm that, that patch of, of ground. And, and we've watched in the, in the, about the three years that that program has been in place, uh, it's expanded by about 3,000%, I think it is. And so wetlands are important. They're, they're vital for our ecosystem and they're vital to be a filtration system for our water and to, for clean water. And I think that's where the spot that we're trying to land is to have, because uh, there's no doubt that Senate Bill 389 will change from the way it was initially filed and even from the way that it uh, passed through the Senate. And I think the House is going to do some, some good work on it and Representative Garten is going to continue. And to try and find a landing space so that it makes it... Um, uh, a bill that's uh, effective in protecting our wetlands, but also a little easier um, and a little less onerous in its regulation. Daniel, I would just add to that. I think that uh, Senator Bray has hit the nail on the head. It, I haven't seen the specific Senate bill yet. I know it has come to the House. I haven't had a chance to have my eyes on it. Um, but truly the problem isn't with the program itself, it's how it's being implemented. And a lot of the farmers in my area are running into this problem where it's, it's not a true wetland. It's um, because wetlands really are important to our ecosystem as, as the Senator said, but um, it's, it's this, we had a odd year and there's this one wet spot that we couldn't farm. And um, it's important that we help those farmers uh, kind of navigate that system and, and make sure that, it's, that the program is being used as it was intended and not, not in a different fashion. And I've heard from developers as well. Um, you know, like I said, they don't disagree with the program, uh, but to put some numbers on it, when you say it increased 3,000%, so three years ago, about a million dollars in these wetland remediation fees, and in years it, in, it ballooned to 28 million. So yeah. they have discovered a cash cow that they are exploiting. And this is a problem, it's, it's not just IDEM, it's you know, our state agencies are these huge bureaucratic behemoths. And whether they're under Democrat uh, governor or Republican governor, they are hard to change. So sometimes you really just have to put the hammer down. And as it passed out of the Senate, <clears throat> it essentially stripped the state of any oversight of wetlands. And um, they kind of dug their heels in and said, well, you know, we're not going to change what we're doing. And so as it's come to the House, I think that the chairman of uh, environmental affairs said, basically, you better come to the table with a plan or we're going to pass it as is and you'll have no power. So now we've got their attention and they're going to look at and I think we will find a way to find a comfortable spot where IDEM is uh, implementing these policies in much more rational manner. The developer I spoke with said, it's, we have to just come up to their standard. It's, they're making us go to the standard that they think it should be. So it's above and beyond what the program says. And so they, they, they have this you know, ever moving goalpost. And we wanna make sure that um, it's implemented as in a fair and rational way. Great. Thank you. Um, I have, I'm going to jump to a question for Representative Baird before he heads off here, and that is an agricultural question. I thought that'd be right up your alley. Um, what, uh, what are your thoughts regarding tax abatements to those who purchase new farming equipment? Uh, I mean, I would always preface this with, with I'd want to see the specific language and, and see how that would move forward, but I would be supportive. Um, uh, Senator, uh, excuse me, Representative Mayfield, any thoughts on that? You know, I think that we, if I'm not mistaken, we offer tax abatements to capital improvements in buildings and, you know, assembly lines. And 
this is the equipment that's necessary to run a farm, which is a business. So I would be open to having that discussion. And Senator Bray, what about yourself? Yeah, I guess I would say the same thing. It's not an idea that I have talked about or thought about before, and uh, um, uh, but certainly open to have the conversation and, and uh, to see what that would look like. I mean, I get the investment that a farmer makes is massive. When you talk about buying a, a tractor or a, uh, uh, a combine, you know, there's can be three, four hundred thousand dollars, and so I, I uh, certainly get the high level of capital cost there. So happy to have that conversation. Great. Uh, just for the uh, audiences, uh, um, so the audience is aware, Representative Baird did have to leave. So uh, we are going to continue with our questions. Um, so uh, our next question is on the subject of education. And that question is this, uh, and we're going to start off with you, Senator Bray, if that's all right. Uh, with sure. regards to voucher expansion and educational savings accounts, um, House Bill uh, 1005, uh, Senate Bill 412, and Senate Bill 14, 413, are you concerned that this will create long-term fallout for students or for property values in rural communities? I guess uh, with regard to the second piece of that question, I'm not, I don't know that I'm concerned about it uh, having a, a impact on property values. Um, and I think the impact, if it works like they're supposed to work, would be a positive impact on uh, students because it gives parents a choice to, uh, to kind of fashion their education and send their uh, child to a school that's a good fit for him or her. Uh, the, real, the real value in student vouchers, and I know they can be controversial, but the real value in them is that if I've got a student I can say if it's my son or my daughter that's going to a school and uh, it may be a very good school, but for whatever reason, they're not thriving there or they've fallen between the cracks or they've gotten to a position where they just um, do, uh, you know, maybe they're being bullied or whatever the case may be, that they find the, the school and the place that is right for them. And parents are the group that are best able to, to select that for their child. And so uh, I think that uh, it's pretty positive. Now, uh, uh, lest I ramble a little bit, I will say that when I start looking at the education savings accounts and in the last 10 days or so, I've been spending a lot of time with those. That is a new concept. And uh, there, are, when it's not, there are a few states that have done it, Arizona, um, uh, Florida, maybe Tennessee as well. And we've started looking at some of the things they've done there, but because it's a new program, certainly to Indiana, if we move forward with it, we want to make sure that there is accountability there so that those students would have to take uh, iLearn and we know that those students are out there learning the things that they need to be learning. We also want to make sure that it's tight enough so that there isn't abuse and so any money, the money would be kind of disseminated by the state treasurer's office in the, at least in the current bill as it sits right now. But we're going to make sure that there are enough guardrails around that that it is spent very specifically for uh, things that are very clearly educational purposes, whether it's tuition to a school or uh, uh, tutoring from some approved vendor, things of that nature. And uh, the devil's in the details in a lot of that. Um, while the concept has some merit, we want to make sure that it will work smoothly. And that's what I've been spending my time on lately. Yeah. Um, I, I, agree with the Senator Bray's first comment is I don't see how this affects property taxes or property values much, but into the uh, other aspects, yeah, ESAs, uh, educational savings accounts, even though we have had bills filed in the past, this is the first time we've actually had some hearings and debates on it. Uh, if the four or five states that already have them have only them for three or four years. So that's sort of the reason why we, we didn't just jump right in and we're only jumping in now with disabilities and certain limitations. It's, it's not uh, it's available to everybody. We had to pare it back quite a bit. Uh, the fiscal on it was just too much. I, I know that a lot of you have heard that we suddenly found $200 million for education that we didn't know was there. And, and I say that facetiously. The, the 
the fiscal on the bill that passed the House was pared down to about 60 million. So we had to eliminate uh, the of disabled veterans from the program. We took essays from 100% down to 90%. So it's the same rate of reimbursement as vouchers. And we had to put in a lot of guardrails. This is, this is not a debit card educational savings account where you can spend it uh, as you see fit. Voucher side, uh, you know, this is, again, the right fit for the student and the family. That's what this is all about. And 90% still choose, or more than 90% still choose public school because that's where they want their child to go. So unless, if everything stays where it is right now and everyone's happy in their traditional public schools and the people who do vouchers continue at their school, then fiscal impact because nothing will change. The assumptions on that fiscal actually assume that almost everybody who qualifies for one of these vouchers will take it. And we know that that's not true. We've had charter schools for 20 years and we still have less than 4% of our student body attend charter schools. So they did not you know, run away from traditional public schools like rats on a sinking ship. Vouchers for 10 years and we're still in that 3% range of students attending voucher schools. So a, a, a non-public school is not necessarily the right fit, even if they're eligible. Um, Arizona has had ESAs for four years and they just now cracked the thousand student mark. It's not like people are gonna be rushing away from traditional public schools because families have decided that that is the best fit for their family. Well, school choice is all about. And if you go to a public school, not only do you get 100% tuition funding, whereas the other choices only give 90%, but in a public school, you get 100% of approximately 3,000 plus dollars of property taxes stay with your child. So there, there's already additional funding that's built into the traditional public school model. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things that uh, I wanted to address, uh, it's funny, I was just uh, texted by Jamie on this one. There are quite a few questions that are going through the chat and um, some of those questions are already on our list and we're gonna be getting to those shortly. Some of those questions, uh, and I don't know if we'll have time today because uh, we already are at 10.08. Um, some of those questions we may not be able to get to today, but do do know that your question will be asked to the and sent to the uh, um, uh, to the representatives and to the senator. Um, so with that, one of the questions that have been asked in our chat right now, but also is in my list of questions here, uh, regards COVID-19. And uh, the question, we're gonna start with uh, you, Representative Mayfield. Um, the question is, some people feel that the governor's emergency orders and government restrictions have been too honor onerous on businesses and citizens. Some feel that it's not been, that not enough has been done. With that context, Indiana has been under various executive orders for the last year. How is the General Assembly planning to address um, this and similar emergency, emergency declarations in the future? Well, there are two bills that are moving forward, one from the House and one from the Senate. Uh, first of all, I guess I should distinguish between the state of emergency and the executive orders, because there are two different things emergency was just declaring you know, that this existed and that gave that gave the governor the authority to issue the executive orders the thing that people are having a problem with is the executive orders not the state of emergency the state of emergency is necessary for us to get any of the federal dollars which is billions so we need to leave that in place we need to start addressing the governor's authority to do the other things things I want to say about one of his executive orders. It was the very lengthy one. It was issued um, fairly early on where he, uh, it was the biggest deregulation bill, essentially, with a stroke of a pen that we've had, we've seen in this state for a very long time. Um, just as an example, you know, curbside delivery of alcohol. Were it not for this pandemic, we would not have ever had or even considered curbside delivery. Well, this year, now that we've seen how it works and are fairly comfortable with what kind of um, guardrails to put on it, 
we actually have a bill that will allow curbside delivery of alcohol moving forward. So what he did in some ways was very helpful to give us the um, opportunity to create legislation to make some of these practices uh, statute and others are uh, a little more troublesome. I don't doubt the governor's intentions one bit. I truly believe he is doing what he thinks is best for the state of Indiana and it is different all over the place. Just like the question said, some people want him to do more and some people want him to open it up. Uh, I think he's trying to strike that balance. The House bill, it, it, we're approaching this in two different ways and I hope Senator Bray will address the Senate bill, but the House bill creates a new, not a special session, it's called an emergency session where it can only deal with the state emergency that was declared in a special session, it's the Wild West. You can introduce any bill you want. And so that's why we wanted to try and keep it out of a special session. Um, so we created this emergency session that can be called by who essentially the legislature has elected their leaders. So it's the ones we've put our trust in um, to make that call. There are some constitutional issues we're working on. It is a bill that is looking forward, not looking back. There are other bills that are trying to address, you know, what is the definition of an essential business, an essential worker, et cetera, because that's, that's inconsistent everywhere. We have another bill that wants to limit the ability of local health departments to make those declarations that are beyond what the state is doing um, without any kind of uh, elected oversight. So we had to, the, we've heard from the public is kind of broken up into a lot of different bills so we can keep things moving. Uh, the Senate has a slightly different version. Both of them have passed their initial chambers. I think that in the second half, we will find the language that we need. Um, and, you know, I, I just, I would love to see the governor make the decision to open up our state on his own without being pushed by the legislature. But I understand and I, I think we are poised to step in if necessary. So I'll, uh, um, I can address that as well. And Peggy, Peggy is a, a spot on really in everything that she said. Um, another example I can say there, you know, there's, we have as a, as a, as a state, really as a country, and I suppose we've moved had forward by years in the way we use technology just because we've been forced to in the way we communicate and have meetings virtually etc but um, um, one of the things that we've learned is that uh, a lot of the state's regulations and we take we take our regulatory environment very seriously with the idea that we do not want it to be overly onerous for people who are trying to uh, work and live here in the state of indiana but some of these executive orders have uh, released some of the uh, regulations that were already in place. And the best example I can give is on telehealth. There are lots of regulations on what you can and can't do with regard to telehealth. Based on the COVID-19 experience, the governor released a lot of those regulations and lo and behold, we found out that the sky didn't fall. And so maybe some of those regulations weren't necessary. And, and so we're putting into code on a more permanent basis, the fact that those regulations won't be necessary and so people can get more of their health care via telehealth and won't have to travel across uh, various counties in order to see a doctor. Not with everything, because sometimes you have to see the doctor in person. There's no doubt about that. But but uh, so that's an experience that we can benefit from. Um, the other thing that uh, Peggy's exactly right, the House has come up with their version. The Senate's come up with really a pretty different version, so we're going to have to find a way to merge those two. And we've got meetings uh, that uh, this, even this next week trying to make an effort to, to do exactly that so that we can find a spot to land and uh, to deal with the, uh, the uh, governor's uh, uh, executive uh, declaration and executive orders. Peggy also mentioned that there's a difference between that emergency declaration and the governor's executive orders, and she's absolutely right. Um, and uh, what, what the Senate is trying to do is put together a framework in which the uh, General Assembly plays a little bit more of a role. 
I don't think anybody thinks we, that the General Assembly needs to be making decisions on a daily or hourly basis on emergencies that they kind of unfold. There's 150 of us. We're not designed to do that. And I can tell you as you're in a, in a, as I'm in a room with my caucus members, trying to make any decision can be really challenging because you know there's a lot of strong personalities in there, a lot of good ideas, and we have to we have to work through those before we can really land in the spot. So we can't make decisions as quickly as an executive branch can. But it's really important that we have input into both the executive declaration, but also some input into those executive orders that the governor issues. And the way our current bill works, that has already passed the Senate, it's gone to the House, the House bills come over to the Senate, is it would essentially give the governor about 45 days for an emergency declaration. But after the 30 days, um, he would have to call us back in if he wants to continue that emergency declaration. And even before that happens, there's an advisory committee that's put into place that the governor would have to consult with and discuss. And that advisory commission could give the governor recommendations as well as take information back from the governor's office to the General Assembly so that they can have a clear understanding of what is going on. Now, in large part, that was informally done this year. The governor did a pretty good job of communicating. And he's done a pretty pretty good job of handling a really, really difficult situation over the last 12 months. But this would put kind of a formal framework into place. And uh, if he calls us back into session, then the General Assembly could make some decisions as to whether that declaration should continue and also be at the table for any of those emergency orders so they can have more of an input into those orders, but also into how to uh, distribute or appropriate any federal funds that would come from that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, one of the things I want to make sure we let the audience know, um, and those are in chat, we are trying to get through all of the questions. We will not be able to get through all of them. Um, and there are many subjects that people are talking about. So as I start to whittle down which ones are going to be our final questions. I am going to try to go to questions that um, are on topics that we haven't had a chance to address yet. It is not does not mean that your question is not important. Your question will be given to state representatives and our state senator, uh, but uh, we just we are limited on time. So I'm, I'm doing my best. Uh, we may also have sometimes questions that are repeats. Um, and so, you know, your question may be asked in a slightly different way simply because we chose, uh, we happen to choose the, uh, per the other person's phrasing of the question. And it was just because that might have been the, the simplest way to ask that. Uh, with that, as I read this next question, the questions are, this is a direct question from a constituent. Um, it is not me asking the question, it is the constituent, but uh, I, will be I will be using their phrase phraseology. Um, the, uh, the topic is medical cost, and here is the question from one of your constituents. I know many people who, who put off seeing a doctor or having a non-life or having a non-life-threatening surgery or procedure because of not knowing the financial burden it may impose on their family. Then on the flip side, someone is rushed into a surgery or procedure and ends up with a bill that financially ruins them, no matter how low the range payments are. What can be done about this? Medical care costs are out of control and frightening. Um, Senator Ray, do you want to tackle that one first? Yeah, I'm happy to. And I can tell you that it is one of the most important things we can be dealing with right now. Um, and uh, and we dealt with it, uh, both uh, Representative Baird and Mayfield and, and I last year, we worked on a number of initiatives that would help in that regard. I, I frankly had great expectations of working again on it this legislative session, but we spent more energy dealing with uh, COVID and uh, governor's emergency orders and things just based on the experience we've had over the last year. But Indiana, I'm, I'm sad to say, is not doing well in this category. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a study done of 25 states, and we were the highest of those 25. It turns out, frankly, that we're about fourth highest in our hospital costs in the nation, uh, a number that, frankly, is completely unacceptable. And so we've tried to do a number of initiatives, and we did last year a number of things that really bring transparency and some economic uh, competitiveness factors back into the healthcare industry that haven't existed for a long time. 
Uh, those have to do with, for example, uh, you have to get a good faith estimate from a doctor within five, before five days of going into a procedure so that you understand what those costs are. I think we all know right now, if you want to try and find out what your appendicitis surgery is going to cost, it's almost impossible to find out. I mean, maybe the doctor will tell you what her fee will be, but you have no idea what the actual cost of the hospital room and the facilities there would be. And it's just, you, you can't, you can't get the answer to the question right now. And so that's coming up. It's had a kind of a delayed start date, but it's coming up uh, very shortly and uh, an all player claims database so that we can figure out exactly uh, uh, kind of make comparable costs across various hospitals and care providers to figure out where those costs are and how it's more expensive. Because the bottom line is this, if consumers, you know, when you go to the grocery store, you compare the cost of milk to Walmart to Kroger, and they do that in every consumer transaction that is made kind of across their financial spectrum with the exception of health care. And we've got to make it easier to find out what those costs are so people can do a cost-benefit analysis. And that shining that light alone would make a big difference. And we did about four or five different pieces last year. There's a lot of work yet to be done with regard to that. We're going to continue working on it. There's a few ideas this year, for example, uh, we're kind of urging and working on some legislation right now to uh, to ask nonprofit hospitals to have a public meeting every year just to talk about uh, kind of their finances and what they're doing to try to make healthcare affordable because We've got some great hospitals across the state, but um, they are far and away some of the most expensive in the country, and these are nonprofit hospitals. And so there has to be an explanation there. And again, trying to shine a light there, I think, will be take us a long way into improving that. And some of those nonprofit hospitals have $9 billion in reserves. So it does make you wonder um, why why their costs are so high, and that would be uh, you know among the the top offenders in this study. Um, not only do so, there was federal legislation also about the I, I think it was 300 most common procedures had to be put out there uh, on the right. off claims database, and so Indiana originally had 100, and so we are aligning with the federal law and making it 300. We're also protecting the patient from the in-network, out-of-network that happens when you're in a in-network hospital. Maybe the radiologist is not in that network. Uh, so you're, you won't get the balance bill for an out-of-network provider um, if you are an in-network procedure. So, we, and again, we, this is we're taking it one step at a time because uh, healthcare is just such a huge, huge section of our, not only our economy and, and our expenses, uh, but it's, everybody just wants lower prices, but it, it takes so much to, to break down the details behind it. And every hospital will tell you, if you do this, we're going to shut down. Well, those hospitals haven't shut down unless they were already in trouble. We, yeah, we have a problem with rural hospital availability. Uh, but it's, it's not as bad as they make it out to be. You know, I want to piggyback on that because um, as, as Representative Mayfield said, we've got the nonprofit out there with eight, nine billion dollars in reserves. And, um, um, and uh, you know, that you have to you have to wonder if that makes sense. And, uh, but on the same token, you also have a lot of uh, rural and community hospitals out there, maybe old county hospitals that, that have very little in reserve. And so you have to be careful when you craft legislation to, to uh, uh, not, as you're, as you're doing that, not to create a scenario where some of these more rural hospitals will go out of business or become unviable because goodness knows we need those hospitals in our communities. They are an anchor to a community, both in the jobs and the salaries they create, but most importantly, and most obviously, you, know, you want a community or a hospital in your county so that you don't have to travel to uh, go get your health care. And you want, if you're going to be hospitalized for a few days, you want uh, it to be easy for your family to get there to provide care for you because you know, that helps in your 
moral support and keeps your strength up. And in so many other ways, you want uh, that, that health care in your community. So we have to be really sensitive to that as well. Thank you both. It's a, a, obviously a, a very important uh, situation that's going on for citizens in the state. Uh, moving on to a very different subject, uh, redistricting. It is uh, it is that time that it, it is that time, and uh, so the question is this: What is the status of redistricting, and how how can we be sure redistricting will be done fairly? What are your thoughts on a nonpartisan redistricting commission? We'll start with uh, Representative Mayfield. My thoughts on a nonpartisan redistricting commission is there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a nonpartisan anything anymore because you are appointed by partisan people and you are expected to fulfill their expectations. So there is a very difficult time finding anything nonpartisan. Um, as far as the, dis the census numbers it was announced that we're not gonna get them until September 30th. And this is gonna create some real challenges, and I'm speaking from my former experience as a clerk. So if, if the state doesn't get the numbers until September 30th, then they have to draw the maps and they're gonna do their hearings all over the state and then present the bill for approval in the house. So it'll have to be a special session with the only purpose being approving the, the legislative maps. So now we're into October. Um, the election is November 8th of 2022, which means a lot of positions require residency by November 8th of 2021. That gives a couple of weeks to approve the maps, information to the clerks who have to re-precinct their entire counties, which is not an easy task. I've done it. <laughs> and so we're... The, the, the strategy or the, the solution behind this is still developing um, but to, to realize that you've got to have it all finished by November 8th because you have to know what district you're living in if you're going to run. It's not just January filing time. So it'll be very interesting to see if there's any pre-work that can be done and then just you know finalize and tweak it so we can have a head start. And I know that... Um, Senator Bray is one of the people that would be on that, like four or five people who uh, make that decision. So uh, I don't know if those discussions have really kicked into high gear yet. So Senator Bray, you have a thought? Well, so yeah, they, those conversations haven't kicked into uh, to, uh, too high gear yet, obviously. And Peggy, you're, you said uh, uh, the consequences of this delay much better than I could. And, and, uh, I think Part, at least that's based on your experience as a clerk and understanding that all the nuance that goes along with that but but not getting those numbers until September 30th is really gonna be very difficult on uh, on us to get ready for next year's elections uh, the one thing I'll weigh in on is uh, uh, representative Mayfield already said and it was part of the question is uh, the thought about an independent uh, uh, group or council to uh, to draw the districts and uh, I, I agree with Representative Mayfield. You know, the Indiana Constitution requires the General Assembly to draw the districts, first and foremost. So anything that would happen, we would have to vote for. And if you try to put together an independent council, first of all, anybody who is going to go on to that is going to have an, a, an opinion. And, uh, and the people that appoint those people are obviously going to have an opinion. So you're just not going to take politics out of it. The end result could be, and then I think that's been the case in any, any of these uh, councils or uh, commissions that have been put together uh, elsewhere in the country today. So if the commission puts something together and, um, and it, let's just say hypothetically speaking that it's bad, then where, where's the General Assembly? It can either go along with it or it can say no, and ultimately we have to say yes or no because the Constitution requires that. But um, uh, we're kind of in a position then where we um, have to say no to something the commission said, and that puts us kind of in an untenable position. The bottom line is this, in my opinion, that the Constitution requires the General Assembly to draw the districts, and um, uh, we need to be held accountable for the districts that we draw. 
We'll take a lot of input. We'll do as good a job as we can. And in fact, in 2010, I wasn't there, nor was Representative Mayfield, but Indiana was largely lauded as having done a very good job of drawing districts that were compact and succinct and keeping communities of interest together. And in fact, it was kind of highlighted in Governing Magazine. Ultimately, that article ended up in the Washington Post. We intend to do the same kind of quality work this time. One of the things about those last maps, even though we weren't there, um, you hear a lot, you know, Indiana's the most gerrymandered state, et cetera. Well, interestingly enough, it looked a lot worse before the 2010 redrawing of the maps, which those maps were drawn under Democrat rule. And Indiana it was one of the few states that did not go to court over their maps. So it met all of the expectations or all of the requirements of redistricting. Great, thank you very much. Well, we are just a hair past our time. So uh, first off, I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, we did have a few hiccups getting started, but it all worked out. Um, I also want to say to everyone who uh, submitted questions, thank you. Even if your question did not get asked today, it will be sent to our legislators. They will be uh, have the chance to see that. Um, there are many questions that did not get asked. Um, we went through about half of the ones that we had been that had been pre-submitted to us, and of course, many people ask questions in the chats. So uh, I do want everyone to realize that uh, we we really worked hard to try to get all of your questions in and to try to give a variety of questions on a variety of different topics. And frankly, we didn't cover all the topics uh, either. So uh, with that, um, we want to thank uh, both Representative Mayfield and Senator Bray, and of course. Uh, Representative Baird who was on before for taking some time out of their busy schedule right in the middle of the session. This is actually a great time because this is this is when things are really happening and you get a better idea of what bills are actually going to be happening. So with that, I'm going to turn the time back over to Darcy. And again, thank you, Darcy and Jamie, for putting all this together for us. Yeah, we appreciate everybody um, taking the time out today to be here for us. We're sorry about the technical difficulties, but hey, <laughs> when you live in this day and age, you, you have to expect it. So thank you, everyone. We appreciate you. Have a great day. Thank you all.